Hey folks, just a quick announcement before the video starts. This channel has just kind of exploded recently, and most of you are new here, so welcome. Because views have gone through the roof, I've looked at the possibility of monetizing the channel, because that way I could actually concentrate on making more videos. But Google doesn't seem to like that idea, so I will continue to make these as and when I can. After all, I have a living to make, and so YouTube will have to remain a hobby for me. However, I would ask that if you enjoy the content, please consider sponsoring me on Patreon, or else buy my book from the link in the description. Now, with all that said and done, thank you all so much for your support, and let's get on with it. With the coming of the jet age, the size and expense of aircraft carriers, and of the aeroplanes that flew off them, exploded. When the USS Enterprise, CV-6, commissioned in 1938, she had been designed to fly biplanes, displaced 25,500 tonnes, and measured 809 feet in length. When she was taken out of service a mere nine years later, she was replaced by the USS Coral Sea, CV-43, which dwarfed her at 45,000 tonnes displacement and 968 feet in length. The Coral Sea would in turn be overshadowed in 1961 by the Enterprise's namesake, CVN-65, which on top of being nuclear powered, displaced 95,000 tonnes and measured just short of 1,100 feet long. This growth meant that no country other than the United States could afford to operate first class carriers in any real numbers. And that was a problem that the Soviet Union, pitted in a battle for supremacy against the US and the West, really wanted to solve. What the Soviets needed was a way to build smaller, less expensive carriers that could fly aircraft sophisticated enough to offer something worthwhile. And one technology seemed to offer that. Vertical takeoff and landing, or VTOL for short. The principle is that an aircraft using vectoring jet nozzles can take off and land, well, vertically. In terms of how this affects aircraft carriers, it allows them to be built much smaller and lighter and dispense with a lot of the complicated and expensive machinery like catapults that conventional carriers need to operate their aircraft. And this principle definitely has possibilities. During the Falklands War of 1982, the British Sea Harriers, a VTOL capable design, proved a useful air defence asset in protecting the Royal Navy's ships. Like the British, the Soviets were early appreciators of the potential of VTOL aircraft, especially in a naval application. The Yakovlev Design Bureau were to be the Russians' main explorer of fighter designs featuring this flight method. Conducting development work throughout the 1960s, they would develop a VTOL fighter that went into service with the Soviet Navy in 1976, the Yak-38, NATO designation Forger. Being the first carrier multi-role aircraft to ever go into service with the Russians, the Yak-38 was very much a proof of concept. Broadly comparable to the British Harrier, and I say broadly because the 38 was by all accounts pretty useless, the aircraft had a lot of limitations, being only capable of transonic flight and carrying a couple of short-range heat-seeking missiles. In comparison to American naval aircraft in service at the time, such as the extremely formidable F-14 Tomcat, it was a sitting duck. What the Soviets really wanted was a VTOL aircraft capable of supersonic flight and fitted with a top-rate radar that would allow its carriers to be able to represent a much greater threat to NATO forces and enable the Soviets to project their power much more effectively. Design work began even as the Yak-38 was just coming into service and soon produced a quite remarkable aircraft, the Yak-41. This aircraft was expected to be a vast improvement on its predecessor, Fitted with a single vectored thrust R79 turbofan capable of 35,000 pounds of thrust for propulsion, and two smaller vertically mounted RD-41s located behind the cockpit for takeoff and landings, the Yak-41M, as the projected production model was designated, was expected to be capable of Mach 1.5. It was also planned to fit a modified version of the MiG-29's Zook radar and fire control system enabling it to use beyond visual range missiles like the R-27. The Yak-41 would also be equipped with a 6-barreled 30mm cannon and four underwing hardpoints. 
Though the aircraft would still have been inferior to the Tomcat, its ability to carry BVR missiles and have reasonable flight performance would have made it a much more formidable opponent and easily comparable to a lot of other fighter aircraft of its day. Four prototypes were built, with the first flying in March 1987. The first VTOL landing and takeoff from a ship occurred in September 1991, and one prototype was damaged a few days later in an accident, though fortunately the pilot was able to eject safely. The Yaks would demonstrate excellent handling and agility during testing, and even go as far as to make an appearance at the Farnborough Air Show in the UK in 1992. But that event would very much mark the type swan song. Like many what-if aircraft, the Yak-41s were doomed by their timing, as well as a helpful push from competing Russian design bureaus. Not wanting to put all their naval aviation eggs in the VTOL basket, the Soviets had initiated the construction of conventional carriers in the early 1980s, the Kuznetsov class. These were, and still are, capable of carrying modified versions of the MiG and Sukhoi aircraft in Russian service, and as such made much of the need for a specialised VTOL fleet fighter like the Yak-41 redundant. On top of that, the Cold War ended in 1990, and the Soviet Union itself dissolved at the end of 1991 leaving the Russians with far more pressing concerns and a practically non-existent defence budget. The Yak-41 programme was therefore, and not very surprisingly, closed down. Two of the remaining prototypes are currently on display at museums in Russia, and that would be that. Though there is one intriguing footnote. As I pointed out in my video on the American MA-31 drone, at the end of the Cold War, a number of American defence manufacturers were very keen on working with their former opponents in the ex-Soviet Union. After all, these guys were often at the cutting edge of contemporary military technology, and now desperate to earn cold hard cash. And one of these American defence giants, Lockheed, thought that the Yak-41, or Yak-141 as they called it for some reason, was of quite a lot of interest. At the time, Lockheed were developing their entrant for the Advanced Short Takeoff slash Vertical Landing Competition. This was intended to provide an advanced VTOL capable aircraft to replace the Harriers in service with the US Marine Corps and the Royal Navy. As a result, Lockheed purchased a lot of the technical information on the 41 from the Yakovlev Bureau, particularly on the design of the swiveling jet engine nozzle and elements of the aerodynamic layout. This data helped Lockheed design their next generation aircraft, which was subsequently entered into the United States' new Joint Strike Fighter competition in the 1990s, which they won. The aircraft was the F-35. Now, it's easy to look at the design similarities and say, oh, it's an American Yak-41. That is hugely inaccurate, as the F-35 was a product of decades of research projects from multiple companies. But it is fair, I think, to say, that the West's foremost strike fighter, one that will see decades of service throughout the 21st century, has a good blob of Soviet Yak-41 DNA in its makeup. Thanks for watching, hope you enjoyed the video. You all have a good one, stay safe, and I'll catch you all again soon.